your bulletin and your Bible. Those are the two things you want to be grabbing. We're going to do things a little bit differently here today. In your bulletin, you see um, I've made a little handout there for you with the text. Uh, and we have very limited time this morning because we have three baptisms and we've got testimonies coming up and we've got people sharing. So our sermon is going to be condensed. And uh, most of you are smiling at that. Okay, so we're going to use this little handout to work our way through. And so if I miss anything, uh, you'll have it there and you can catch up uh, on your own. Our passage is Luke 15. If you don't have the handout, then crack open your Bible and follow along. The passage relates well both to Father's Day and to the baptisms that we have planned. This section right here is the most famous of all of Jesus' parables. It is known as the, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, do you know what a prodigal is? I always forget what a prodigal is. And so a prodigal is someone who spends money in a reckless and extravagant way. That's what a prodigal is. So they put that name uh, in there. But it could also be called the parable of the two lost sons. We're going to see today that there are two sons in the story. Usually we only focus on the younger, the prodigal, but there are two sons. And we should not forget about the other one. Or even the parable could be called the parable of the loving father. That's what I'm really driving at here today is the love of God, the love of the father. This is one of the longest uh, parables and one of the most detailed parables that Jesus gave. And unlike most of the other ones, it has more than one lesson to teach us. Each of the three main characters has something profound to teach us. And to understand the parable well, we should be studying these characters. And, but this could go on for weeks. You know, this parable is so rich and we can look at it forever. And so that's why we're going to use our handout to work our way quickly through it. We're going to go through the text, and I'm going to stop along the way to make some comments. And so my hope is not that we understand everything in the passage, but basically that we just understand the main points of what Jesus was getting at in this story. Look at the text there. The key to understanding the whole chapter is found right in verse 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him. So here we have Jesus, he's teaching, and look at the kinds of people that are attracted to him. Tax collectors and sinners. I want to tell you a little bit about these people so you can understand the kind of riffraff that are surrounding themselves uh, around Jesus. The tax collectors were the worst kind of people. They betrayed their own people by working for the Romans. They collected taxes for the evil Roman Empire, which would be used to fund the Roman army to oppress the people of Israel. So these, a lot of them Jewish tax collectors, were working for the enemy, and so they were hated. They also extorted way too much money from people, so they got super rich while the rest of the people are suffering in poverty. The sinners, on the other hand, these are immoral people. They would include people like prostitutes. You also have, as part of the sinners, in their culture, they thought of diseased people and deformed people, maybe you have a birth defect, those people would also be considered sinners. So you have the immoral, you have the prostitutes, and you have some weird-looking, diseased people there, okay? These are the sinners. So you got them and the tax collectors, and those are the folks hanging out with Jesus. These, are, these people are attracted to Jesus, which tells us something about his message. Verse 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man... Receives sinners and eats with them. Whoa. So he receives them and he eats with them, showing that he's not ashamed to be with them. Now you also need to know who the, the scribes and the Pharisees are. The Pharisees, <laughs> they were the super religious people. They were very influential among the people. And let me just tell you right now, they were a lot better than you. They were a lot better than me. These guys followed the Bible, and they knew the Bible like no one else. They believed that the way to God was through obedience to the law. 
and they kept it better than anyone. The name actually means separated ones. Okay? So yeah, you have these, these righteous guys, and they're looking at Jesus, and he's receiving a bunch of sinners and tax collectors, and they are not happy about it. We also have the scribes. Now, a scribe, you know, a scribe will, um, writes things, but this is not really what it's getting at here. The scribes in those days were expert lawyers. These people, this, these were the real smart guys. This is the guy with a law degree and a PhD in theology. And his job was to interpret the law of God and to teach it to the people. Okay? So these are the enemies of Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes, and they are just not having it with Jesus. You see, because Jesus was actually a lot like them. Jesus kept the law. He actually kept it perfectly. And he also was a great teacher of the law. He was the greatest teacher of the law of God. So they want Jesus to look like them. They want Jesus to follow in their ways. But instead, he's doing the exact thing that they would never do, associating with sinners and tax collectors. So it is in with, within this context that Jesus now gives the parable. Look at it there, verse 3. So he told them this parable. Notice that it says this parable that's a singular it, he, it doesn't say he told them these three parables. It's just one parable. Luke says it's one parable. So even though Jesus is going to tell us three stories here, it's, they're all driving at the same thing. It's basically one parable. Let's uh, go over the first two here quickly. You have the parable of a lost sheep, then a parable of a lost coin, and then we get the parable of the lost son. Now, you, you really want to be looking on this handout now because and follow along there with the colors, okay? You see in verse 4 there, um, it's talking about if a guy has 99 sheep and he loses one, he will go after the one that is lost until he finds it, okay? So any good shepherd, if he loses his sheep, he will go and find that sheep, okay? So point, I want you to see that when one is lost, the shepherd goes out to seek for it until he finds it. We see the same thing in verse 8 there with the women looking for her lost coin. These coins, uh, she was obviously not a very rich uh, uh, woman, and so she only has 10 coins and she loses one. So this is a big chunk of money for her. And then it says there, she seeks diligently until she finds it. Okay, so the same point there. And the, the, the point of these parables, I love it, Jesus gives you the punchline, he gives you the answer to what the parable means right there in verse First one we see in verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And we see the same thing, verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So there is divine joy in heaven over repentance and restoration of sinners. Okay? So... This is why Jesus is associating with the sinners and tax collectors. He wants to see them come to repentance. And he says, he gives us these stories to show the joy in heaven, this great joy. All of heaven is rejoicing with God when even one sinner comes to repentance. Now we get to the parable of the lost son. Verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. Two sons, and I like how the subject there, there was a man. So I want to focus on the father today. The man is the subject, and this man had two sons. So don't just focus on the one son. But here he is, the youngest son, the infamous youngest son. And we see the youngest son's sin and his foolishness. That's what we're going to see first. And we see that there in verses 12 to 16. I'm just going to point out a few highlights here. So you got this youngest son. And he says to his father, Father, I want the money that is mine. This son was supposed to get a third of the money of the estate. His dad was, seemed to be a wealthy kind of guy. And so he says, Father, I wish you, would, I wish you were dead because I just want my money. I want to get out of here and I need my money. And so this is super disrespectful. And any reasonable father would have slapped him and said, sit down. And uh, don't speak to me about this again. But this father, in this story, remember this is a made-up story, Jesus says he divided his property among them, among the sons. 
So he, li he goes and he finds a way, he liquidates his assets and gives a third of his money now to this son. And here we see what this dumb son does with it. Not many days later, the youngest son gathered all that he had and he took a journey to a far country. And there, he squandered his property in reckless living. This guy is partying. He's, he's been cooped up at home too long, so he's like, I gotta go see the world. I've got to go let loose a little. And we see, actually, if you, if you peek ahead there, all the way to verse 30, he says he, de he devoured the property of the father with prostitutes. So he's not using the money to go for expensive dinners here. He's, letting, he's getting way out there. He's, he's messing around with prostitutes and wasting all this money that his father gave him. Gave him in reckless living. But because he's stupid and he didn't prepare for the future, soon there was a famine that arose, a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. Okay? So now he's in trouble. He's got no money left. Look what sin cost him. Yeah, he was. He thought sin was attractive. It was awesome. I'm going to go. I'm going to meet people. I'm going to meet girls. We're going to have the time of our lives. My dad gave me so much money. This is going to be awesome. I'm set. But within a matter of a short time, there he is. He's on the street. He's in need. And now he needs food. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Okay, now you're thinking, all right, whatever. I can work on a farm, take care of some pigs. This is not okay for this guy because he's a Jew. Okay, and pigs are, are an unclean animal. You know, to this day, the Jews don't eat pork because in the Old Testament, a pig was a very unclean animal. It was, you would be ritually defiled as a result of eating a pig and being with these pigs. And the pigs are just disgusting. So it's, it's a brutal job. And there he is, but it gets worse than that. And it says, he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So the pigs are doing better than him. He wishes he was a pig at this point so he could just eat some pig food. But no, he is below the pigs at this point. So his sin has, allowed, has made him hit rock bottom. This son represents the vile tax collectors and the sinners that Jesus loved. Jesus is giving this illustration. He's setting it up and he's inventing this character. This son was the worst sinner Jesus could invent. He's so insolent, he's disrespectful to his father, and he's a fool, and he wastes all this money, and he's living in sin with prostitutes, and he ends up being lower than a pig. So Jesus invented this, this son to illustrate and represent the tax collectors at which the Pharisees were taking such offense. Second, we want to see the son's repentance. That's the good news about this story. We saw earlier in the other parables, remember verse 7 and verse 10, there's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. So they don't stay a sinner. They come to repentance. And here again with this youngest son, he, verse 17, came to himself. He says, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? So he's saying, The, wor the, the lowest of my dad's servants... They got more than enough bread. And yeah, I am. I am doing worse than a pig. So he makes a plan. Verse 18, I will go, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Here we see that the son is truly repentant. He has more than regret over the dumb things that he's done. He's truly sorry. He says, he makes no excuses and he makes no claims. Check what he says. I'm no longer worthy. And he definitely wasn't worthy to be called the, the son anymore. So he makes a plan. He says, there's no way my father can forgive me. I've been so brutal. So he makes a plan. He says, just make me one of the hired servants. I'll be a day laborer. I'll be the least of the least. I, I, I just, I'm dying. So I'll work so hard, I just want some bread. So this is the plan. We can see that this person is truly repentant. 
So now in the story, he repents, or he represents a sinner who truly repents. Right around verse 20, you see I drew a little box around there, verse 20 to verse 24. And now the focus of the text shifts towards the father. The father represents God in the story. Much like Jesus, like Jesus who was a loving and receiving and welcoming of sinners, we're going to see the same thing here with the father. He represents God who is eager to forgive and longing for the return of the sinner. Verse 20. And he arose and he came to his father. By while he was still a long way off, his father said to him, or his father saw him. This shows us that the father was looking for him. The father is waiting for his son to. He is eager to forgive. He, he, he's ready to forgive his son. As soon as he saw his son, this, look at how the father responds. In your note there, you see those, uh, what I've marked there in, in pink. It says the father saw him, he felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him, and he kissed him. Without a word even being said yet, this is what the father does. He runs towards his son. He felt compassion in his heart because he loved him. So he runs. And this, was, you know, this is not the thing to do. If you are a wealthy uh, man in the ancient world, you're not going to pull up your dress, your little gown, and run across the field here and dirty your feet after your idiot son who's been away and just wasted all of your money. This is ridiculous. So the Pharisees are looking at this like, what kind of father, not only was he a fool to not punish his son earlier, and he gives all his money, now he's humiliating himself by running after this kid. He kissed him, and he embraced him. Already we see the deep love of God and the faithfulness of God in the father. Verse 21, and his, father, and his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Okay, and look, notice how he doesn't get to the other thing. Oh, dad, make me a hired servant. He doesn't even get to that because now the father jumps in. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Wow. Here we see the father completely forgives the son. He makes, he completely restores the relationship that was damaged. The father doesn't care about his plans. The father doesn't want his good works. He doesn't want to hire him as a servant. He wants him as his son. And so he says to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. There are four things that the father gives him here. And I just quickly want to uh, remind you of what they represent. The best robe marks distinction. Okay? This is... This is like a t his tuxedo. Bring a tuxedo for this kid. We're going to party. He needs the best outfit. It marks distinction. Next, he gives him the ring. The ring, the signet ring, represents authority. The son, in the absence of his father, the son represents the father. And so it shows that the father has given his authority to the son. Very important. Next, he gives him shoes. Okay, this son, I don't know what he was wearing at this point, but he obviously doesn't have shoes. He's disgusting. He was working with the pigs, and he probably doesn't have a lot of clothes either. So, but his father says he needs a robe, he needs a ring, and he needs some shoes. And this is interesting because slaves didn't wear shoes. If he was going to be a day laborer, he wouldn't be getting shoes, but he's going to be a son. He restores to him full sonship, so he needs to have shoes like a son and a free man would have. Yeah, number four, this one's crazy. He brings the fattened calf out, and the fattened calf would be reserved for special occasions, okay? These things, they're going to cut, they're going to slice up this thing. It feeds hundreds of people, okay? This is going to be a huge party that he's putting on. The father doesn't cheap out. He's not saying, bring me a chicken over there. We'll have a little dinner here, three of us. No. Bring the fattened calf. This thing is saved up. Maybe this is saved up for a wedding or something massive. Bring that. We've got to celebrate. Uh, again, what does he say there? Um, end of 23. Let us eat and celebrate. Verse 24. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost 
and is found, and they began to celebrate. Here we see the heart of the father. His son was as good as dead to him, but now that his son has returned to him, it's like he's alive again. He was lost, and he is now found. So the father, because he seeks sinners, and he, his joy is to see them come to repentance, he has to celebrate. We've got to celebrate quickly. There was one person who wasn't too excited about this, and that is the oldest son. Here we see the oldest son. He pops up. He's, he's going to get some attention now from verse 25 to verses 30. Now, the oldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Okay? So the oldest son, he's doing the right thing. He's a good son. He's the righteous son. So he, he, he's out in the field actually doing something productive. And he comes near the house, and here they are. He's hearing the music and the dancing, this amazing, massive celebration that's going on. And he calls one of the servants, and he asks, what do these things mean? And the servant says to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him safe and sound. So the servant's like, oh yeah, man, we're having a huge party. This is awesome. You know, I as a servant probably haven't had meat in like months. So this is a great time. And this is, we're having a party. Look at his response though, verse 28. But he was angry and refused to go in. He's not too excited about his silly brother coming back, and especially now that they're having this huge party in his honor. The Pharisees would have identified with the older son. They, he's the good son, in a way. He's doing his work. He, is, he hasn't gone off in, in wild living. And so this son and the Pharisees, they are angry, and they refuse to enter in. They also find it disgraceful what the father did. How can my father throw a banquet for this son? This is disgraceful. Here again, we see the father coming out. The father takes the initiative and seeks out the sinner. He goes, verse 28, his father came out and entreated him. But 29, but he answered his father, look, you see how disrespectful that is? Telling his father, look, look here, buddy. I'm going to tell you how it is. These, these many years, I've served you. I've slaved for you. And I've never disobeyed anything you've said. I kept the law. And you've never even given me a young goat that I can celebrate with my friends. This is terrible. You see here that this son has no relationship with his father. He doesn't love his father. He's estranged from the father. His relationship with the father is like a slave and a master. I've slaved for you. I've never disobeyed you. And you never even given me anything. Here, your son comes back, and you killed the fattened calf for him, and I don't even get a goat. One thing that always struck me about this parable, he says, that I might celebrate with my friends. Here, we just sacrificed the fattened calf, and we're saying to you, please come in to join the celebration. He's like, no, I want to, I'd rather have a goat that I can celebrate with my friends because he truly doesn't love the father. Verse 30, when this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He's very upset. And he feels this righteous indignation at his disgraceful father who was a fool and welcomed home this terrible sinner. This son is a legalist. And legalists are the enemies of grace. They hate the gospel of grace. And false forms of religion always attack the grace, the free grace of biblical Christianity. The oldest son, he wanted to earn his reward. He said, listen, I've done the right things. I've served you. I've never disobeyed you. So I therefore deserve something. But the father is not interested in this works righteousness. The father's about grace. Even when this oldest son is disrespectful, the father comes out and treats him. The father is also loving 
towards the older son. Sometimes we, we have grace for the younger son, right? But we don't have any grace for the older son. We are so irritated and so frustrated by self-righteous hypocrites that we don't have any grace for them. But Jesus had grace even for the hypocrites, even for those self-righteous Pharisees and scribes. I want to give you a quote here from Matt Chandler. He's a pastor at uh, Village Church in, in, uh, in Texas. He says, The scandalous grace of the Father is that whether we are caught up in legalism or license, he invites us to the party. So the Father is eager to forgive all kinds of sinners, both the lawless one, the younger son, the blatant external sinner, as well as the legalist. The Father's grace is so scandalous that he invites everyone into the party. Both of these sons were rebelling against their father, but they were both invited in. The father's love covers a multitude of sin, all kinds of sins, the, sin, the hypocritical sins and the, the flagrant wild sins. God's love covers all of those. Remember that during Jesus' ministry, whenever he was preaching, he was preaching to the people and to the sinners, and, but he also was preaching to the scribes and the Pharisees. So he was continually extending grace to them as well. But the sad thing is that there were more sinners who came to repentance, the, the tax collectors. Remember, Matthew was a tax collector, and Zacchaeus was a tax collector who was saved. But we only know of one Pharisee who was saved by the end of the gospel story. You remember, his name was Nicodemus, and he came to Jesus in John 3, he wanted to hear about salvation, and when Jesus was buried, there Nicodemus was joining in to help. I like Aaron's translation. You, my translation is not as fun. Uh, mine says, uh, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. What do you all say? We had to celebrate. Uh, 32. Yeah, we had to celebrate and be glad, okay? God is not grudgingly celebrating, oh, someone came to salvation, ah, oh, you know, great. No, God is excited about it. He celebrates your salvation. He wants to and he has to celebrate. There's one thing I, I, I want to say quickly, too. And this came from John MacArthur, you know, the, the preacher in California. This is so important because sometimes we are so man-centered in our theology. We just think of ourselves, and it's all about the sinner, but there's something greater here. The celebration is not in honor of the younger son. It is in honor of the father. In heaven, the party is not to honor the sinner, but to honor the Savior. What of that? That... It's amazing that we are saved. That doesn't make us amazing. It makes Jesus amazing. Right? So the party in heaven is to celebrate God. And there we will be worshiping God and praising Jesus' name forever because of the amazing grace that he had to sinners like us. Verse 32 there. We're wrapping it up here. You see, again, the other father gives the punchline. So Jesus doesn't, remember in verse 7, he said, there's more joy in heaven, uh, there's joy in heaven when a sinner repents, right? And then again in 10, and here, uh, the third one, to drive that point home, 32, for this your brother was dead and is alive, he was lost and is found, okay? And it was fitting, it was, we had to celebrate and be glad. So there we see the father in the story actually giving the punchline. Don't you want to know what the oldest son did? I would like to know, Jesus doesn't tell us, he didn't fill out the story for us, but the parable is left open-ended. Jesus kind of, he doesn't really finish the story, as, well, at least kind of, I would want to know, okay, what happened to this kid? Like, did he, did he come in or not? The older brother doesn't respond, and so we are left to imagine to uh, exactly what he did. And this also uh, confronts us and asks us now, how will we respond to the grace of the Father? Some of us are like this self-righteous older son, and we've been invited in now, and so now it's up to us to decide 
Will we continue in our rebellion against God? Or will we let go of our selfishness and our stupid pride and enter into the wonderful joy of the Father? By ending the, par the parable in this way without really giving us the ending, Jesus is also confronting the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay? Obviously, they represent, the oldest son represents the scribes and the Pharisees. And so this is, again, Jesus he left it there, and it's up to them now. Are you guys going to come in? I'm inviting you too. Will you believe the gospel and repent? Before we conclude, I want to make a few points of application. We've seen the love of the Father, that he seeks out sinners and shows extreme grace to save them. And this is good news for you and good news for me. Because no matter how sinful we are, God is inviting us to repent and be completely forgiven. There's no sin that is too big for God to forgive. Remember that self-righteous people bring no joy to heaven. You bring joy to heaven when you repent and when you glorify the Savior by confessing your sin and being forgiven of it. As an application, we want to imitate the love of the Father. I want to ask you, how many of us have been ridiculed for being the friend of sinners? Eh? Oh, Erica over there. Erica's very, um, Erica is 95 years old, so she's had 95 years of sanctification. But let me tell you, I don't often get that too much because I'm sitting in my Christian bubble and I don't even get out there to associate with enough sinners. But Jesus was attacked and ridiculed because he loved sinners so much and he spent his time with them. We want to be like Jesus, like Erica, and we want to get out there and we want to reach lost people. We want to bring them to Jesus. The task of the church is not just to, for us to hang out here and protect ourselves. We actually want to reach and find lost people. So we got to have the courage to get out there, to speak to anyone, to, to not be ashamed of like, oh, this guy is so uncool or he's so sinful, I can't talk to him. No, you need to have the courage to go talk to them and also, don't be afraid to talk to these people about their sin. Some of you are very good at this. You hang out with, with unsaved people all day, right? Like when I was in the construction business, I would hang out with non-Christians all day. Uh, but you need to be a light there, and you actually need to tell them about your sin. You can't just be a silent witness your whole life. You actually need to open your mouth because Jesus was inclusive of sinners, but he was intolerant towards sin. We're not going to tolerate people's sin because that sin is killing them and that sin will end up destroying their lives like it did with the younger son. Second application. We should expect that God will seek and we should expect that God will save all kinds of sinners. There's a cool thing. If you look there, I highlighted it. Uh, verse 29, the older son says, you never... And then in verse 31, uh, the father says, you are always. The father is always looking for people to save. He, he's not, he doesn't have this never attitude. He is always faithful, and he's always working to save all kinds of sinners, both the legalists and the lawless ones. Third, Maybe you didn't have a good experience with fathers. Uh, I had a good father, a loving father. But some of us here have, didn't have a great earthly father. And so every Father's Day, it, maybe you don't have the joy and all the fond memories that, that you would want to have. But this story is wonderful because we see this amazing heavenly father that we have. And he loves you. And he's working all things together for your good. So even when your earthly father lets you down, you have a heavenly father and you will spend your eternity with him. Finally, we've seen that there is great joy in heaven when a sinner repents. And the good news is that the church gets to join in with the celebration. We get to join in with the rejoicing. We share God's joy when a sinner repents. And to transition, this morning we have the privilege of celebrating together the baptisms of Andrew Combs, Faith Foster, and Andre Bonici. 
They've responded to the call of the gospel by repenting of their sins and by faith trusting in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. We rejoice with them as they come to publicly profess their faith in Jesus and obey his command to be baptized. Baptism is an outward physical sign of an inward spiritual reality. Baptism, of course, doesn't save you, but is a symbol pointing to the reality of your salvation. It's like a wedding ring. I didn't think I would use my ring as, a, as an illustration this much this morning. When I wear the wedding ring, it doesn't make me, auto, I, I'm not automatically married. Okay? But the wedding ring is a symbol pointing to the fact that I am married, and it tells the world that I have committed myself in a lifelong marriage relationship to my wife. Therefore, baptism is a beautiful picture given by the Lord Jesus that points to the spiritual transformation that takes place when someone rightly responds to the gospel message. Paul in Romans 6 verse 1 to 4 teaches that baptism serves as a physical, visible picture of our death and burial with Christ along with our spiritual resurrection with him and that it identifies us with him as our representative head. Baptism not only identifies the believer with Jesus, but it also identifies us as members of God's people, the church. Alvin, uh, you guys can get up here. We've prepared a couple of songs uh, to sing while the four of us go to change. Um, we're going to transition right into our baptisms. Uh, so just give us a minute. We have two songs, um, and then we will hear the testimonies and do the baptisms. <laughs>